Welcome to our conversation. I'm delighted that our guest today, Patricia Donahue, is joining us. She is the Associate Director of Financial Aid. Welcome, Patricia. Thank you. It's good to be here. Thank you. Um, so tell our viewers uh, about your position and what you do at Financial Aid. Mm -hmm. The position is I'm the Associate Director, and what that basically means is I oversee uh, customer service, and right now we're a joint office, so it's Financial Aid and Student Records. Mm -hmm. So we um, service all of the students at the front desk and phones and emails jointly. Okay. So I oversee the customer service. Mm -hmm. In addition to that, I oversee the application processing mm -hmm. of financial aid applications mm -hmm. and the counselors that advise students. Okay. In addition to that, mm -hmm. I also um, oversee communication and messaging so that students are aware of mm -hmm. what we need to tell them. Yeah, and uh, you know, as a student, mm -hmm. I do get the emails, Good. and, uh, <laughs> and you, know, you read them. <laughs> yeah, and I and I sometimes read them. <laughs> uh, but it's, financial aid is, is is a really important topic. Yes. You know, one of the burdens and you know, barricades for students attending college mm -hmm. is is financial aid. So um, why is it important for students to be more aware of their financial standing? That's a great question. Um, we make sure that students, we try to make sure that students are aware when we need some information so that we can file, we can complete their application in a timely manner. Mm -hmm. And we all know that if everything gets done in a timely manner, yeah. then the aid gets credited to their bill or they get the refund that they're waiting for so that they can either pay for books or um, other expenses, educational expenses that they have, mm -hmm. or if they're living off campus, paying the rent and, uh. and other educational um, mm -hmm. expenses off campus. Yeah, and uh, even on the personal note, I mm -hmm. used to file late and you know my brother always he'd tell me you know file early. Yes. And it is important to file early because once the aid runs out there's very little capital for this. Well students. let me explain that a little bit. Yeah. Um, what happens is we have set in the past a, a recommended filing date. That mm -hmm. doesn't mean that you can't file after that date within the aid year mm -hmm. or within the enrollment period. Mm -hmm. But what that does is it allows us to um, award additional funding mm -hmm. that is limited. So if a student is eligible for Pell or New York State TAP or loans, that money will always be there. It's, they're considered you know, an mm -hmm. entitlement or there's money that will always be. But there are campus-based funds that run out, such as work study, federal work study, Perkins loan funding, or other types of grants. And so if a student is eligible for those types of funding, it will run out after we start packaging students so it's a first come first serve kind of thing mm -hmm. but you know if a family knows that they're only going to get loans mm -hmm. they don't necessarily have to meet those deadlines or that recommended filing date yeah. but for those students of that you know need the extra help mm -hmm. they definitely want to apply by that recommended filing date and uh, speaking of dates uh, we spoke yes. earlier um, there's going to be a huge overhaul of the system so there's going to be a change in the filing of filing. the federal um, mm -hmm. application. Mm -hmm. So what's going to happen is starting with the 17-18 FAFSA filing year, mm -hmm. students are going to be able to start filling out that form earlier than before. Mm -hmm. Before it used to be after January 1st every single year they would you know get their tax information together and mm -hmm. file it for the next academic year. Mm -hmm. Well starting this October mm -hmm. 1 they will be able to file for 17-18 um, using their 2015 income. Every, they're going to start hearing things like prior prior year yeah. and that's what that means. It mm -hmm. means that currently we're using the prior year's income mm -hmm. but this new process will allow for prior prior year income. Mm -hmm. So for two years they're going to actually be using 2015 income to mm -hmm. file their FAFSAs. Yeah. And, and for undergrad students um, mm -hmm. they are, most of them are dependent on their parents and uh, once you reach a certain age for grad students and um, mm -hmm. late uh, students um, in age, you know, late students in age, sure. you become independent even if you're still living with your parents. That is true. Once you can answer the question on the FAFSA that you were born before a certain date, mm -hmm. which is making you 24 or older, mm -hmm. then yes, no parent income is needed. In your 20 years of experience, what's one of the, the patterns or, you know, uh, the tips that you can have mm -hmm. for students. You know, what sort of things that you see students doing that they could really 
improve on? Sure. Um, well, as we mentioned, applying by the recommended filing date if they want to get the best you know, package mm -hmm. that we can offer them, mm -hmm. if they're entitled. Mm -hmm. um, the second thing is, as we start to notify students of information that may be missing, if uh, we need a certain document to complete their file, mm -hmm. they, I really recommend that students pay attention to the email notifications that we're sending them so that we're not hearing from them a week into the first day or the week of classes, you know, when classes start and saying, I don't have any money. We want to really get those things taken care of for them so that we can ensure that their bill is paid and that they have the refund they need. Mm -hmm. Now, yeah, and speaking to uh, Susan, the student accounts, yeah. uh, your, your neighbor. Yes, <laughs> yes, we work very closely together. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, and she always stresses, you know, students being more aware of mm -hmm. their standing. A lot of students just leave it to their parents. and um, That's a really good point yeah. because we find that there are a lot of students that really don't have to pay attention mm -hmm. or don't want to pay attention. I'm not really sure which it, which it is, but mm -hmm. it's really important. I think it's a good life skill mm -hmm. to start working with the school, mm -hmm. our office, Sue's shop, you know, to just make sure they're aware of the things they need to take care of. Mm -hmm. And so that when they get out after school, mm -hmm. after they're done with their education, mm -hmm. um, they'll already be used to taking care of things like that. Yeah. So, and a lot of times, you know, there are, there are parents that may not be um, as computer savvy as they are. Yeah. And so it, it leaves kind of a, a gap mm -hmm. sometimes we'll see. Mm -hmm. So, and certainly if they have questions or they're unclear about something because their parent has taken care of it before, we'll be happy to sit down with them and go through things so mm -hmm. that they understand themselves. Okay. Yeah. Um, now, in terms of, you know, for our viewers, prospective students, mm -hmm. um, of course, being financially aware and also planning, you yes. know, planning ahead. Um, what's one of the recommendations you have for students wanting to come to Binghamton or any university in general? Well, we usually try to tell families that it starts a lot earlier than right before you come to college. Mm -hmm. So if it has to, um, if it's within their years of high school, mm -hmm. I highly recommend um, starting to understand the process. There is a tool that the federal aid, uh, uh, federal department of education has that they can go in and do a mock FAFSA. They can start plugging in some numbers and getting used to what the information mm -hmm. and the terms are and what's available to students before they even apply to, mm -hmm. you know, to college. Mm -hmm. So that, you know, I think that's just a really great planning tool. Mm -hmm. The other thing is to have a conversation with parents about what they can yeah. afford. Yeah. Because there are times when, you know, students will apply to all kinds of schools and I think that they should. Mm -hmm. But I think they also need to have a realistic conversation with parents mm -hmm. to understand, you know, if they're... Um, if there's a certain cost involved that they yeah. need to stick within or mm -hmm. and if if not mm -hmm. that's great but if there is and they apply to different colleges mm -hmm. then they just need to be realistic about what the expectations are of that and and the expectations of the financial aid office mm -hmm. and what we can provide okay now in terms of um, for those students who perhaps are you know independent mm -hmm. and below uh, the age of perhaps 24 um, who do work maybe full time to support themselves? Mm -hmm. um, is there any um, is there any policy um, mm -hmm. that works there? Or do they still have to claim their parents, or how does that work? There are special circumstances that we find with students um, on occasion mm -hmm. where either their um, their family has broken down, or there are uh, reasons why they shouldn't be in contact with their parents or or other reasons you know but there's usually a special circumstance involved mm -hmm. and on those limited in those limited situations we will sit down with the student mm -hmm. kind of get an idea of what's going on mm -hmm. um, if they can provide documentation to support everything that they're telling us we can certainly uh, look at the FAFSA data again and figure out how we can do maybe an independent override mm -hmm. and what that that's a an internal yeah. term but yeah. it really means that we would then be able to um, only include the student's income. Mm -hmm. But again, you know, there has to be very special circumstances outside of the student's control. Mm -hmm. Now, you know, being a student myself and, you know, starting college, you're, you know, 18, 17 mm -hmm. years old. Sure. You don't know what you're going to study. And, you know, what happens is, you know, for programs like TAP, you have to declare a major. Um, and certain students don't know what they want to do. Mm -hmm. um, so as you progress in your standing, you know, from freshman, sophomore, junior, um, there are certain effects on your financial aid. 
um, and also your fifth year, um, perhaps your, your tap runs out. Mm -hmm. So could you elaborate on sort of the dynamic of standings and, you know, how Sure. To... Um, usually what happens is there, there's different types of funds mm -hmm. that have certain types of criteria, as you're mentioning. So for well, what we can do is we can start with federal Pell Grants. If you're eligible for federal Pell Grants, you are allowed six years of Pell Grant funding. Regardless of if you've finished your program or not, that is the maximum you could get. Mm -hmm. um, the, for TAP, you also have six years of funding. Mm -hmm. But you have to declare a major once you become junior level. Mm -hmm. So it means you have to figure out what's going on and yeah. where, where you're leaning towards really? so that you can continue to get that funding. Mm -hmm. But usually, I mean, they do give a student a couple of years to try and, you know, hone in on what it is their interest is. Yeah. So that's the good thing, you know. Mm -hmm. So for the first two years, they don't necessarily have to declare a major mm -hmm. to get TAP. They okay. just need to be um, working towards, you know, academically yeah. progressing mm -hmm. towards a degree. Yeah. Um, for loans, mm -hmm. students can take out loans mm -hmm. and they get different amounts based on their grade level. So as a freshman, they could get in there and say they're a dependent student, so they're using parent income. They could get up to 5,500 in student loans. Mm -hmm. As a sophomore, they can get 6,500. Juniors and seniors, 7,500. Mm -hmm. So you know, and yeah. then there is an aggregate loan limit. So mm -hmm. because they don't, you know, this is all. What this is all really saying yes. is that they want students to progress and yes. do well and mm -hmm. get a and get a degree mm -hmm. for the amount of funding that they're getting. Yeah. So they don't want you to stay in school for 10 years, yes. you know, and not make progress. Yes. So that's really what this is about. Mm -hmm. And it's trying to help you get through so that you are yes. getting a degree and, and being yeah. successful in, in the work world. Now in terms of uh, progress, um, you have the undergraduates. Um, mm -hmm. In terms of graduates, um, do you also handle that, that aspect? Yes, we do. Yes. And um, what's some of the differences for the grad students? Mm. Well, the funding is very different mm -hmm. as far as federal aid goes mm -hmm. and state aid, really. Um, for federal aid, they can apply for um, up to $20,500 a year in unsubsidized loan funding, mm -hmm. which is very different than yeah. what I just told you about the undergrad loan mm -hmm. limits. Mm -hmm. For uh, they, There is also a graduate plus loan mm -hmm. where students can borrow in addition to the $20,500 provided mm -hmm. that they get credit approved mm -hmm. and that their cost of attendance um, warrants it, yeah. you know, but a lot of, most of our students do not borrow grad plus. Oh, you know, really? they'll take the twenty thousand five hundred. and That mm -hmm. seems to be mm -hmm. that seems to work. It work. Yeah. Now you know, there's many programs and, like uh, public uh, affairs that that have a mm -hmm. five year track where you're sort of an undergrad, but you're also a grad student. Um, how does that work? Well, that's that's yeah. a good question. Yeah. Um, we will continue to fund as an undergrad mm -hmm. until you actually get your degree as an undergrad, mm -hmm. and then switch to grad. Okay. So, and then once you become a grad, officially a grad student, uh -huh. then the new rates or the uh, new types of loan types. funding begin. Okay. Um, the other thing that I wanted to mention is that um, for New York State funding, mm -hmm. um, grad students are no longer eligible for New York State aid. Oh, so funding. TAP. So TAP stops mm -hmm. once you're once mm -hmm. you've gotten your first undergrad degree. Okay. And just to give our viewers just a, a general sense, you know, mm -hmm. what is the difference between subsidized, unsubsidized? You know, a lot of these terms that they see right. and they're like, you know, so. sure. So uh, the federal government basically subsidizes mm -hmm. the federal subsidized loan and what that means is they'll pay the interest while the student is going to school. Mm -hmm. So the student doesn't have to worry about any of that until they graduate or fall below a certain like six credits mm -hmm. um, and then they go into repayment six months after that. Mm -hmm. That's when the interest starts accruing. Mm -hmm. For the unsubsidized loan, it is just that. The government doesn't subsidize that loan, okay. so the interest accrues upon disbursement mm -hmm. right away. Mm -hmm. We often, as a tip to students, say if there's any way you can pay that interest while you're going to school, that mm -hmm. is a great idea mm -hmm. because all that interest accrues, mm -hmm. and when they go into repayment mm -hmm. six months after they graduate, yeah. then they're paying interest on top of interest. And um, does anything change for our, you know, students who are out of state and who are international? Binghamton is a huge international sure, place. Sure. For example, they pay more money. Um, 
you know, being a citizen does mm -hmm. does matter. Um, so, what are some of that those well, dynamics? Yeah. For international students, mm -hmm. um, there are there they would not be eligible for federal aid because they are not considered a U.S. citizen mm -hmm. or an eligible citizen. Uh, so they would be probably paying out of state tuition. Mm -hmm. um, there is limited funding for institu um, international students, but mm -hmm. we have um, there are some lenders out there that are addressing that need mm -hmm. and so students can apply for um, an alternative private loan mm -hmm. they may need a US cosigner and I know that there are some new companies out there that are not requiring cosigners mm -hmm. to help students that are studying here mm -hmm. and and for students you know who are exposed to so much culture and um, mm -hmm. Who do study abroad? Um, what's mm -hmm. interesting is that uh, financial aid still follows them wherever they go. It does. Um, if they are, if they go through a SUNY program, mm -hmm. you know, so they're still enrolled here at Binghamton. Um, yes, their financial aid would pay towards that study abroad uh, semester. Okay. We often have students coming in, coming mm -hmm. in and talking about the costs and yeah. and making sure that they have enough aid. And mm -hmm. um, there are times when they may not have enough funding, and yeah. so we try to talk to them about mm -hmm. how they can access other yeah. things like either a private alternative loan or mm -hmm. have their parents take out a Parent Plus loan to help mm -hmm. with that additional cost. Okay. Yeah. Now, um, when when speaking to Susan, um, she says if you uh, are lucky enough to get a scholarship, um, you have to of course disclose that. Um, because then your federal aid goes down. So if you get a scholarship um, and your cost of, um, of attendance is it's higher, then you actually get less federal funds. Um, what happens is if a student does get a scholarship, mm -hmm. we try to first reduce the loans mm -hmm. because we, you know, that lessens your loan debt and that way you don't have to, that's less to pay back later. Mm -hmm. But if within that cost of attendance, it allows for everything that we've offered plus the scholarship we're not going to be adjusting anything okay. the goal is to not not have funding that goes over the cost mm -hmm. of Binghamton for that year mm -hmm. if it doesn't go over then we don't need to do anything now um, what's interesting you know um, how do you really calculate the cost of living for example mm -hmm. it's easy for um, on-campus students in a sense that we uh, know what the charges are. Yeah, yes. you know what the charges yes. are. You know they probably have a meal mm -hmm. plan, so sure. you know that they're eating. But there's a lot of off-campus students. Yes. And depending on what neighborhood you're from, sure. um, their cost is higher. Yes. So um, how do you accommodate, or what kind of algorithm do you have? Sure. Yeah. So there's a couple of things that we look at. We um, there is a survey that the geography department does every two to three years, mm -hmm. and they uh, they actually survey students, and we get actual information about what it costs to live in uh, different housing facilities around the triple cities, mm -hmm. and how much they pay for food and you know mm -hmm. other ins other expenses that they may have. Mm -hmm. So what we do is we look at an average budget mm -hmm. for that we can do for any off-campus undergraduate or mm -hmm. um, yeah. graduate student mm -hmm. and then we come up with an average living allowance okay. that living allowance has been pretty on for uh, the last yeah. uh, as long as I've been at Binghamton mm -hmm. because when we look to see how that goes along with that survey data mm -hmm. we're usually right about there mm -hmm. so we will ch if if there are students that are in housing that may be higher than what we're giving in an allowance you know say they're living in they couldn't find anyone to live with them they have to live in a single mm -hmm. um, apartment and they're they're paying a lot more than maybe most students would mm -hmm. if they bring in their lease agreement mm -hmm. we can adjust that cost of attend that part yeah. in the cost of attendance for living mm -hmm. to be more accurate with what they're actually paying. Oh, okay. But we don't we don't find that a lot of students have to do that because the amount that we mm -hmm. give for the allowance seems to be pretty close. Okay, that's good. Yeah. Um, so is there anything within the financial aid system that um, you think needs improving or is there anything that's happening currently that you're very encouraged about? I really have to say that the um, move to prior, prior year reporting um, mm -hmm. on the FAFSA mm -hmm is going to be a tremendous help to the financial aid community and to the students because it's going to be a lot easier to file mm -hmm. the FAFSA using, you know, they'll be able to pull in that IRS data mm -hmm. from two years ago because it's already there. Mm -hmm. um, and that way we won't have to ask for tax information as much as we've had to in the past mm -hmm. because it'll already be there. Mm -hmm. So I think it'll be a win-win for everybody. Right, yeah. Now, um, seeing the prior, prior um, initiative, 
what if a student's parents makes more money the prior year? So for the first mm -hmm. two years, they're going to use, let's say, 2015 taxes. Right. And they made maybe $150,000. Mm -hmm. And then the next year, unfortunately, job loss. Sure. So um, how does that calibrate? That's a great question because yeah. we see that all the time. Mm -hmm. So I don't think that that's going to change much as far as our perspective goes because we have always been able to offer um, what's called a special circumstance or an appeal process. So if no matter when, no matter what income you're using on the FAFSA, if things have dramatically changed mm -hmm. to the negative, mm -hmm. you know, like loss of income, yeah. um, high medical expenses, things like that, mm -hmm. we will always account, help to account for that. Mm -hmm. And we have what's called a special circumstance form mm -hmm. that students can download from our forms page, fill it out with their parents, attach documentation and a statement explaining what's going on, and we will mm -hmm correct mm -hmm. the information on the FAFSA to more align with what's really going on. Mm -hmm. And then the goal is to get more federal mm -hmm. grants or you mm -hmm. know more loan funds or whatever it is that they can mm -hmm. tap into as a result of that. Yeah, yeah. what I'm also encouraged about is um, there's, uh, I think the website came out last year, the FAFSA ID, where... Uh, oh yes, it yeah. changed from mm -hmm. having, having to use a PIN mm -hmm. to a username and password. Yeah. Yes. And uh, it's a whole separate site. So you have the FAFSA site where you do your application, but then there's a whole other site which has all the loans you've taken out throughout the year, and there's even mechanisms where you can see what you're paying, what you're going to pay long term. Yes. There is, what I think what you're referring yeah. to is the National Student Loan Database. Yeah, yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. And that is a federal site where they house all of the loans that you've borrowed, all of the aid that you've received, your enrollment history, mm -hmm. lots of really great information yeah. for the students. So you can keep track of where you're at mm -hmm. in borrowing. Yeah, yeah. Um, and then there is a financial tool mm -hmm. on the website where you go to sign in, you're mm -hmm. right, mm -hmm. and it gives you an idea. It's like a budgeting session, you know, yeah. where you can plug in, it, will you log in, and it has all your information, yeah. and you can kind of see, okay, this is what I'm going to pay when I graduate mm -hmm. in my, you know, for my loan repayment, mm -hmm. and this is how much income I'm going to need to be able to be successful at that. That's very true. Now, um, for students who right now, you know, they're looking at their FAFSA and they didn't get enough money, um, what websites or what ways um, can they get money? You know, for one way we talked about is filing early so you're able to get right. Perkins loan, you're able to get um, scholarships that are just meant for the school itself. Mm -hmm. um, you know, private institutions like, let's say, Harvard or, or Oxford, they tend to have more alumni money um, mm -hmm. inside, but mm -hmm. in terms of public schools, the, the funds are limited because it's from the state. Mm -hmm. So, um, what what ways could they get more funding? Well, I definitely encourage students to not only go through the financial aid process mm -hmm. to see what can be done. And we have students that come and see us all the time and we talk through all of the different funding options. And you know, counts, our counselors are fantastic in that they'll sit down and they'll try to even do budgeting conversations with them. Mm -hmm. um, but in addition to those those funds that we have, mm -hmm. I highly recommend looking at outside sources. Okay. You know, there are the stu uh, family employers, uh, father and mother employers, you know, mm -hmm. parents that may have a job where they offer scholarships or um, mm -hmm. tuition payments mm -hmm. or um, community agencies and, you know, just civic associations, all yeah. different kinds of things, as well as mm -hmm. um, there are some really great scholarship search sites mm -hmm. that students can it takes like 20 minutes to do a profile, and once you're done, mm -hmm. they start sending you scholarship information on play, you know, mm -hmm. for you to, to apply based yeah. on the fact that you're left-handed in, in, in uh, engineering or something, yeah. you know. Yeah. But those are really great ways to to try and expand other than the financial aid realm. Okay. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you for joining me. You're it's welcome. It's been a delightful conversation. Same here, Brian. All right. Um, thank you for joining us. Bye.